Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, I am Ariba Hassan Badr here from Bucky TV. And as the community has been continuously hearing from various speakers throughout, um, we have with us, uh, joining us from the St. Louis community, uh, Brother Akhtar, um, Ali Akhtar Amir, Brother Abid Ali, Brother Essen um, Jafri, Dr. Josefa Quinzar, and Brother Nasheed Anbar. Assalamu alaikum. So jumping right into the discussion, um, let's uh, let's start off with um, uh, Brother Ali Akhtar Amir and what your thoughts are on why commem commemorating the uh, demolition of Janatul Baki is uh, so relevant today. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's very important today because um, um, our our Ahl al Bayt is is buried there, and um, when I see the Mazars in India and Pakistan and in, in Iraq and all that. I see these beautiful Mazars there, beautiful shrines. And when I go to Janat al Baqi, you know, there's, there's nothing there on, on this, um, on, on, in, in, in Baqi. So the history is getting eradicated there, you know. So we need to revamp our own, our own history and make sure that the uh, family of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the al Bayt, is, 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 is given the right thing which this universe was created on, for the love of the al Bayt, Alayhi Musallatu Salam. Um, very good points, actually, and and just kind of moving more into that uh, emotionally. What were your thoughts when when you see like the barren land, like you said, of Janatul Baki versus when you go to Karbala and Iraq and Iran and these places that are just so beautiful and all lit and uh, very bright um, with so many uh, zavar there. What are some of the emotional kind of uh, tendencies that comes to mind? Uh, and this could be open to um, any of you um, to dive in. I will respond to it in uh, Salaam Alaikum, first of all. Wa Alaikum As Salaam. In 2012, for the first time when I went for the ziyara to Iraq, and uh, also, I had the honor to uh, go for uh, Umrah and I visited Makkah and Medina. And uh, so the tour that we had, it was, we went for the Ziyara first. So I saw all uh, the Masumins in Iraq and, and their shrines. And I enjoyed uh, my visit there and the hospitality that I, I I saw there that people were so open and uh, you know welcoming you, and uh, they have uh, put out everything uh, for the zayir of Imam Hussein salam in Iraq and every other shrine that we visited too. And uh, this was my first experience, and I was overwhelmed with everything. And at the second leg of the tour was that we went for the Umrah. And when we went to Makkah and Medina, and the kind of the, <clears throat> the image that I had, that I'm gonna be visiting Makkah and Medina and the kind of, you know, the, the places I'm gonna be seeing it. And so already I experienced something in Iraq. And when I went up there, it was like a complete shock to me. I couldn't believe the way I was in uh, in the haram uh, for the umrah and uh, disregard for uh, for the visitors to that holy place and uh, I was totally shocked. I was totally shocked. And then going to Medina and seeing uh, Baki and uh, the Prophet uh, grave and the restrictions that are there and the, the way they treat you. And it was like, uh, you know, a nightmarish situation. You cannot even go to Baki and, and openly make some duas and, and do your salams and stuff up there. 
everybody is there just to push you and shove you and you know around and so this was a complete shock to me i i couldn't believe it. so this is the first hand uh, experience that i had it if i answered your question you know that emotionally what you go through it is is totally you know I'm, i i cannot believe it to this day that you know i was there and what i experienced you know yeah no for sure um it's a shocking thing actually because the contrast it's uh, like when you juxtapose the two together it's there's a big big uh difference you notice so uh definitely definitely um very uh heart disheartening um but then you know when when we start to think of all these emotions that are really coming to us um like why do we feel that the muslim umma is is quiet and why why aren't we doing anything uh to kind of raise our uh, awareness about this you know like why is the umma so silent on this crime against um our this heritage that is so important to us uh, and again this is for the panel um whoever wants to dive in to um take on the question uh, i would like to Uh, pitch in something oh <clears throat> assalamu alaikum and uh, i would like to pitch something over here in the uh, according to what my uh, little knowledge i have when i was in college i remember i had a discussion with a couple of my muslim friends and uh, this was uh, the topic of discussion was uh, karbala and uh, i was shocked to hear that they did not even knew what uh, what incident of karbala was and uh, the the thing i i believe what uh, to answer your question is that uh, a lot of people in our umma are not even uh, dated towards the right they do not even have permission they not they do not even know uh, you know about janat al baqi and let alone the family of the prophet so you know they they are always the misguided i would say in terms of the history of islam they are misguided and uh, a lot of people don't even know about it so i think that is the one reason that the muslim umma is uh, silent about it yeah, i would i would like to add something to that one is uh... the saudi machine has lot of dollars that they spend in marketing and getting some information out wrong information out the amount of money that they spend in spending this misinformation helps them quieten everybody all the dissenting voice, voices jamal kashogi perfect example the guy was raising alarms about what mbs lanatullah was doing and what did they do they just took him out so the muslim umma gets paid a lot of muslim umma people get paid by the wazifa that they receive from saudis they are not going to bite the hand that's feeding them and hence they stay quiet they do understand if you ask them privately they tell you yeah you know this that's a wrong thing but they do not want to stand up to the point that when there was whole a commotion that was being made that they wanted to destroy masjid al nabawi they were quiet even for that because they were afraid that like hey if they speak up then they will be the one to face destruction on their side they are so uh, intoxicated i would say with the dollars that they are receiving from the saudi government that they don't want to speak up they don't understand what the human rights are and alhamdulillah you know what's happening in the world is now there's a realization that religious rights the heritage rights our human rights our basic human rights and that's why we have to stand up we have to fight political scene will change few years back mbs was the best thing that you could hear of in fact some of the shia ulamas was raving about him forget even the sunnis now what's happening people are realizing that this lanatullah does not deserve to live on this planet so look what he has done in yemen even like some of the wahhabi mosques that i know of they have come to realize that hey listen this is a wrong thing that has gone on for 5 6 years 
So they have turned. We have to keep keep at it. And inshallah, it will turn. I would I would just say that uh, both Asan and Nasheed Bhai has just uh, put both the things together. Uh, at the same time that there is, uh, uh, that the Ummah is not aware of some of the things, uh, but the social media that we are living nowadays, uh, the age that we are living in, the things cannot be isolated incidents that can happen with Adnan Khashoggi or, or with Baki or any of these things. The recent events that we have seen, like Nasheed Bhai was saying, uh, especially the Black Lives Matter kind of a movement that was there. It was just an isolated incident. It was happening for so long. Uh, but because of the social media, somebody caught that on the camera and just put it to the world. And even in Europe and in the rest of the world, there were marches and demonstrations uh, against uh, the police brutality in America. So all I'm saying is that awareness has to be uh, created through the social media and through other channels too. And Nasheed Bhai is absolutely right. Not only that there is not awareness in the Ummah, but also at the same time, there is a machine, Saudi machine with the petrodollars is working so aggressively all over the world. Uh, so that is another thing that we have to counter it. So, but it's, it's all possible. It's all possible in today's world and it's very relevant in today's world. Uh, to create, like Ali Akhtar was saying, that we have to create awareness among ourselves first before we go uh, and uh, tell other people about the event, what happened. Just to add, just to add uh, on that, uh, mm -hmm. I think um, the destruction of Bakhi has to be kind of, the story has to be told because the Ummah does not know that there was a doom on Bibi Fatima Tazara Salamullah's grave or, or Aima's grave. They don't even know, the Muslim Ummah does not even know that, that there was a destruction which happened. So the Ummah need, we, I know the Baki is, uh, organization is trying to do that through, through, uh, through various channels, but I think we should educate our own Ummah and the Ummah in large what has happened to, to Janatul Bakhi and the other sites in Mecca also. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, this kind of uh, talk about awareness and using social media and stuff, I would like to know, um, even from actually Dr. Josefa uh, Quizar, if uh, you could chime in to um, say what are some ways that we could start to enlighten the Ummah and talk about this uh, issue more? How do we spread this awareness? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, sister, for kind of uh, organizing this and getting us together and talking about this. I think, number one, I think what your organization does is great, is invaluable. And what you just mentioned, I think, uh, you know, you, you, I think a, a good part of what you do is the education portion of it. Um, I will, um, so I do think, um, so uh, I, I, I I do, I will, you know, I agree with uh, Abid Bhai and uh, Nasheed Bhai absolutely that one of the main issues is education. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, you know, so I do work with uh, a lot of uh, Pakistani uh, people, Pakistani physicians from Dow Medical, Al Khan, random schools in Pakistan, you know, some from India. Uh, but you know, recently when I went to, uh, so uh, when I went to uh, Ziyarat with my family, I took about three weeks off and I returned. A lot of them asked me, they said, oh, how was it? Uh, you know, uh, and, uh, I, and I told them that, you know, you, even uh, if you don't uh, give a lot of, uh, a, if, even if you don't, ha if you don't uh, give uh, uh, Najaf and Karbala and uh, Kufa, kind of religious significance, even if you look at it from a historical standpoint, to really truly understand what's happening in Makina, you actually have to visit Karbala and Najaf, where all the historical sites are intact. Uh, aside from just Baki, uh, you know, uh, aside from Baki, 
that there has been mass destruction uh, and leveling of uh, Mecca in general, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I know we kind of say that, you know, we feel as Shia strongly about desecration of, of our own sites, but they're very indiscriminate in terms of what they destroy. Uh, my father-in-law uh, has actually seen a lot of this history with his eyes. You know, he's, he's going to be 80 years old this, uh, this year, inshallah. And he worked uh, in aeronautics as an aeronautics engineer within the, the Saudi government for a good deal of time and then uh, with the Shah of Iran at some point as well. So my father-in-law, you know, tells us stories about how he saw streets change in uh, Mecca, where, you know, how if you were historically trying to uh, g tell people the history of Mecca, you can't because those historical uh, sites or even uh, landmarks don't exist. You know how normal random landmarks like Walmart are like, okay, you know, that place is right across the Walmart or it's right across Target. In terms of Mecca, they completely demolished the entire area. The only thing except, uh, and, uh, you know, the only thing left is the cube. So I think even, I don't, I really don't think that there is a lot of uh, resistance from the Sunni community. That's not my impression of it, actually, at all. I do agree with you that I think it's primarily an education issue. They just don't know. Uh, so uh, to answer your question of how do you educate such a massive population about what is going on in uh, in Mecca and Medina, I'll tell you. And uh, you know, just uh, it's just a uh, it's just an opinion of a singular person like myself, I think one of the best ways to educate them is to kind of uh, kind of advertise Karbala, Najaf, Kufa, sites like those. Because even though you're Sunni, you know, you don't really care. But at some point, they did have some historical, you know, uh, relevance to you, even sites in Syria. So I think the one of the ways to see what's going on in Iraq and Iran, uh, 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 especially uh, sorry, Saudi Arabia and Mecca and Medina, is to do a contrast with every other site in that region, which is actually controlled by uh, you know, uh, the people who follow the al you know, the Shias. So I think a lot of it is through education, and the education, in my opinion, uh, is through uh, you know, it's through talking about Karbala, it's through talking about Najaf, e even though a lot of Sunnis are uncomfortable with it, and even though I myself feel sometimes shy about it, I talk about it more and more, uh, even at work, like if they want to talk about Makkah and Medina, you naturally have to bring up Karbala and Najaf, because then they get used to hearing it. Initially, they don't like it, it bothers them. But the more you sensitize them to it, the better they understand what's going on in uh, Mecca and Medina. So, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but that's how it is. So. No, th that was, uh, you brought up some good points about um, education and how uh, we should be advertising uh, Karbala and maybe even just uh, putting those two contrast, uh, contrasting images together uh, to create awareness. Um, so very good points. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to go back to what actually what Brother uh, Nasheed Anwar was saying about the human rights. Um, and so recently the UN described uh, heritage, heritage rights as human rights. This means that you know, the human rights um, of many Muslims have been uh, violated because it you know, has to do with uh, the heritage sites. So how would, um, how would we address this problem of like, you know, going to the UN and, and making that um, known. Um, and Brother Ali Akhtar Amr, if you would like to take that. I, I think the first of all, um, we, we as in Bakhi organization has started that. They have approached the UN. It is going in through the motions of the United Nations so that they first put that <clears throat> Bakhi is under the heritage site of the world. And it should be under the one, one of the heritage sites of the world. So once we do that, and then um, as, as I know that 
Baki organization is talking to a lot of other Muslim countries to, to, to kind of say that this is a heritage site to Saudi Arabia and, uh, and making their voices heard in United Nations uh, regarding the heritage sites of, uh, of Baki and Makkah and Medina. Of course, of course. Um, very good. Um, one of the things that, you know, we, we don't think about much is like, once we do get a chance to rebuild Janatul Baki, like, what are some things that uh, personally, like you would want to sacrifice or you would have to sacrifice? And Brother Essen Jaffrey, if you would uh, like to um, take this question on. Sure, sure. Uh so first, I would like to add a few points to your last question, and then I'll come back to this question. Um, so talking about how we can bring this to to the UN, uh, you know, according to my my uh, understanding is that first of all, as uh, what Brother Akhtar Ali Akhtar said, that we need to understand it ourselves. We need to uh, get our community involved in it what Bucky is and what's the significance of uh, Bucky is in our history. And then uh, making it more, first we, when we understand it, then we are much, much, will be in much, much better position to tell about, tell about the significance and the importance of Bucky to the other people of other religions. So just like uh, Jews did, they like, and I, I, I'm not going to go into uh, the debate whether they, that is right or wrong, but what I'm trying to say is they hold their historical locations and uh, religious locations very dear to them. And they, they are really a uh, close-knit community in sense that they make sure that uh, I, I recently, not recently, but a few years ago, I learned about their birthright trip where they allow every uh, every young person born in a Jewish family, they are allowed to go visit Israel to learn about their heritage and their culture. So the reason why I bring brought this example was that because they have, they are trying to get this within their own communities to understand the importance of their heritage and their culture. Then they are much better able to bring it to the world. Now coming forward, uh, coming to the question that you asked me, um, the next question, what am I willing to sacrifice? Um, without a doubt, anyone, anybody, whoever is in the panel, uh, we would sacrifice anything for Ahle Bayt Salam. We love them and uh, we are here because of them. Uh, talking about what I would sacrifice, I would sacrifice my, my laziness. Uh, I, I mean, I'm talking about this because, you know, I would, I would sacrifice my, uh, my staying in the shadows. I would, uh, you know, use my, my, use my Facebook and use my, uh, you know, uh, media platforms to raise more awareness rather than just being, uh, being in the shadows and just, you know, not, not expressing my views and playing on the safe side. I would rather just you know be more vocal about it and then try to uh, get the get my voice across to different people and let them know that this is wrong and this is what has what has happened and why is it necessary. I, I believe that's uh, what my answer would be. I'm sorry for it was a little long. No, no, you're totally fine. Um, and anyone else too can uh, chime in if you guys have uh, something to add to that same question um, about what your personal sacrifice would be. Um, and we, we want to know your, uh, you know, personal kind of um, addition to this. I would just add one more thing, what Asim has just said that, uh, uh, I like that organization that came forward and uh, started who is Hussein. And that just one line uh, is, is, is there all over the world. 
and uh, you know that creates an awareness about the sacrifice of Imam Hussein al Hassan, and it's everywhere. <clears throat> Same kind of a movement probably it's needed for the awareness sake that uh, about Baki, what is Baki, and uh, so probably that would be the one more step in that direction. And of course, uh, we can sacrifice whatever we have at our disposal uh, with our time, with our money, with our life, with uh, anything that we can do for this cause. And this is the right moment, I would say, because uh, the whole world has been connected to, through this uh, electronic media and social media. And any event that takes place in any one part of the world, no matter how small, how big it is, uh, it could be heard so rapidly and so easily all over the world. And like I just gave the example of the Black uh, Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, that it just happened in, uh, in, in one city and all over the world, people were just protesting against it. And as far as the Baki is concerned, Baki is, uh, if we all remember way back during the Taliban rule, what they did to the uh, some, of, some of the monuments that they had it uh, of the Buddhist heritage and they destroyed it. And it was a, a you know, movement all over the world. People were crying loud about it, you know, that it was, and, and they condemned it. Uh, it's the same thing that uh, if we just bring it forth uh, to the forefront, uh, the issue of Baki and uh, we let people know about it. And although, like Brother Nasheed said, and he had a very valid point that the petrodollar that they have has corrupted the whole Islamic world uh, to the core. Uh, people are not even willing to hear about it, you know. And the very first thing that they have done is just taken the importance out of, they don't even regard for the prophet anymore. Uh, I was in some of the meetings in my own town and young friends of uh, you know our community, they were talking about that when we go for Hajj, why do we have to go to Medina? And this is the beginning of it. So if this is the regard that they have it for the Prophet of Islam, then uh, who is Hussain and who is Hassan and Imam Jafar Sadiq and I mean that's that's not even relevant. So they have done uh, a lot of damage, but. Uh, but like I said, awareness is, you know, people are getting back to it because of the social media. People are reading it themselves and knowing the truth about the history. So whatever the Saudis are doing, we, we cannot just blame them and sit home and do nothing about it. We, we do have to come out and do our part. So, and it's possible in today's world. Very relevant. Yes, no, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate about the, you know, sacrificing your time. And, you know, that's something we take for granted all the time. Um, and so I would actually want to um, ask Brother Nasheed um, if uh, you'd like to add anything about uh, how to advance this, um, you know, cause about rebuilding the shrines of our Masumin al Islam. How else can we do that? You know, a few things that we can do is like, for instance, as uh, Brother Rafi just mentioned, the incident that took place in Afghanistan. We need to start to connect these things. And we need to start to highlight the importance of the Mazars and the graves that, that are there. Is, you know, a, a Christian friend of mine was telling me one day that, hey, you know, isn't it such a good thing that we have found the Shroud of Turin? I said, well, I'm glad you have found it, but first, I don't believe that actually belongs to, Je to Jesus Christ, alayhi salam. And the next piece is, there is carbon dating that says it's not. So his answer to me was, you know, I understand that. But the fact that we think we have something that came from there, if it was not really used by him, but at least the fact that it was touched by him, gives us solace. And look at what we have. We had the Mazars that were there that these people, these Lanat Allahis, destroyed. We need to start to connect these things to say, hey, they have violated our heritage. They have violated our rights. And because they have violated our rights, you have treaded upon us. And we need to speak up. We need to, as Brother Akhtar also mentioned earlier, we need to educate ourselves 
the importance of this. And in our own Shia community, I'm talking about as to why it is important. And then also go out, we have to keep at it. If, if people are not going to hear in one shot, we have to keep, keep at it and let them hear over and over again until they start to realize it and they're not complacent. We need to start talking about what was done to Bibi Khatija's house, the noblest nail lady in the history of Islam, what was done to her, how they destroyed it, how they converted it and built toilets over there. This is how their thinking is. This is what we need to highlight to say, hey, listen, they just didn't do, didn't do it to the personalities that we regard highly. They did it to personalities that everybody regards highly. The house of the prophet is totally desolate. You know, if anybody else had these heritage locations and heritage uh, areas, they would be flocking over there. Any, any government would actually use it to be a source of revenue for them. They will have tickets that they will issue. And I will pay a lot of money to go visit these things. The, the Khyber Castle, for instance, the fort in Khyber, you know, things like that. People will just to visit this heritage. I, I bet you even the Jews would like to go and visit them just to see like, hey, this was our glory point once upon a time. But we have moved away. By we, I don't mean us. I mean the Saudi government has moved away. They have started to destroy everything. We need to highlight that. We need to stay at it. Thank you. Very good. I think the bottom line is we need to educate our ummah first, and then also the Muslim ummah in large. Uh, we need to work on it, uh, as, um, as everybody has said in this, that we need to work on Muslim ummah. We need. I know Bakhi goes to the Iknas and the Isnas and all that conferences where we need to tell the story of Bakhi to the ummah in large. Of course, of course, um, that would be definitely the, the right direction. Um, and also, I would like to, you know, as we kind of move towards the end of the segment, um, you all have been such a big part of the, you know, St. Louis Bucky chapter. Uh, we would like to thank you very, very much. And also, I mean, the commitment that you guys have had to the Bucky organization, to the Bucky cause uh, is long and strong. So now that we kind of are approaching this, um, the hundred years, um, what are some things that you think we can do uh, to really, really just highlight this, uh, this cause? And I'm gonna ask brother uh, Ali Akhtar Amr to start off. The hundred years is very remarkable. We should um, have a, a sessions like this through a, like a global session on Zoom, talking about uh, the Bahi. And also I'll take this further in. I was talking to my daughter, uh, Faria, and asking her if Islamic Relief can do something on Bahi. You know, we, we need to approach those people also um, and have a speaker session and, and, and educate as, as we all talked about it. I would just add one more thing to it, that the forum at the UN would be the best forum to highlight this issue at a international level where, I mean, that could be exposed and debated over there. Uh, that would be one thing that needed it because when we are approaching 100 years of it, uh, that would be a, uh, uh, one of the best places, you know, to be and create the awareness uh, for the rest of the world and highlight it at an international level. Uh, locally and, uh, you know, nationally, and uh, we, we can do it uh, through our own uh, Baki committees that we have it in St. Louis and all over the United States. But at the international level, we also uh, bring it up uh, this issue at the UN, uh, because it's a human right issue. It's not just a Shia issue. Uh, mm -hmm. We are going to be minimizing it by just keeping it to ourselves and into a Shia, Sunni, Wahhabi kind of an issue. And uh, this is an international issue, and it should be addressed uh, at that level. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is a human rights issue, and um, it shouldn't be just kept into this kind of Shia like niche. Um, I really like that point. Um, Brother uh, Essen Jaffrey, um, how would you like to advance this um, this cause for Bucky uh, as the 100 years kind of approach? So, <clears throat> so in this case, uh, what I could do best is, you know, uh, get the message across through using my social media platforms. And uh, what I've recently heard, uh, noticed is if a certain if a certain person or um, social media user who has a lot of followers, if they talk about something, it tends to uh, become a trend really, like really soon. And uh, so I was watching one of the YouTubers and uh, so he visited Iraq uh, last year. And uh, it, it was, it looked really nice that, you know, when he went there, he, um, so he made vlogs over there in it, you know, so, uh, so many people from different backgrounds, from, from re different religious backgrounds, from different cultures, when they see this, they have their uh, interest developed that they want to know more about. It. So similarly, um, the best thing I could do, uh, according to however much uh, big my reach is, you know, uh, all my, uh, raise awareness in in way that you know the other person starts to develop a, an interest in the starts you know questioning okay why is this guy talking about this specific uh, topic and what's the significance about it so I think that is something that you know we could do especially when it's going to be hundred years now we can uh, plan it in a way I could just you know try. Uh, make some posts or uh, make some edit some pictures in a way and i would definitely tell my other friends to do to, to do the same there is awareness to a lot of friends in pakistan they might not even know that uh, you know it's going to be 100 years and then now that uh, you know um, i know about it i will definitely you know start to increase uh, raise awareness according to however much i can so in a way that, you know, whoever sees it starts to question themselves and uh, starts to mm, develop, you know, some uh, interest that, you know, okay, why are, is so many, why is this person posting about it? What's the significance about it? And why does 100 years matter so much? Thank you. Of course, uh, thank you so much, um, Brother Essen. Uh, you know, raising awareness, I think, was definitely one of the, the major topics for um, the discussion. And uh, I just would like to also um, have Dr. Josefa, if you'd like to um, just add to the um, advancement of the cause. You might have lost him. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Um, I think... I think we had, uh, you know, brought up a lot of really good points, mashallah, and the discussion was great. Um, and just uh, if anybody would want to um, add ending remarks, um, you're welcome to do that right now. And just uh, to add to your question, actually, I think uh, Hassan talked about it. Uh, it's a very good thing that we are going to have, uh, inshallah, Basam Karbalai at the Saudi border this time. So personalities like that will draw more on the crowds. When Iraqis, they, they'll understand like, they'll, they'll questions like, what's he doing there? And with that, there'll be more coming. We need to get personalities like that. We need to have our speakers also speak actual proper English, not something which is broken high school English that they're speaking because you're not going to attract crowds. It's like, it's no longer attracting Elders, it's now getting to the youth. We have to be engaging them. We need to work on that. We need to have youthful speakers full of energy who can attract them, who can bring them to the fold. If we don't do that, then we are actually going to lose them. They'll be complacent. They will not realize what they're missing. And along with that, you know, there was a, 
the movement, some of several movements that have been started, as I mentioned, just by a single tweet. We need to get to that point. We need to have a mass movement that takes on from a simple event. And uh, Brother, Brother Abid Ali talked about it, that United Nations is a good venue. When that's going on, when we're present and when we hear from them, take that and highlight that. That's going to cost us some money to be all over the media and we'll have to fight it actually because even media like CNN and all, which is in the pockets of the Saudis, will not be letting our word get out, but we have to fight them, get our word out. Bring them to say, United Nations, see what's happening here and start to broadcast that. That will help, help us out and that will take us a long way. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for all joining today, taking time out. Um, just by coming and joining in this discussion, you have helped advance the cause um, just a little bit further, you know, um, and I really appreciate that. The Bucky team appreciates it. Um, so inshallah, let's all pray that um, we rebuild Janatul Bucky as soon as possible, inshallah. Zakallah Ariba, thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the team. You have yeah. done a lot. Yes. And thank you for Bucky team to for organizing this and and doing everything possible yeah. through Marana Mabu Mehdi and all that. Thank you so much. And thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, sister. Uh, I I do agree with everything with uh, what the panel was saying, especially what Mashid had mentioned. Uh, I think uh, genital Bucky is a much broader issue. It's not just a solely Shia issue, and I've, especially after coming back from Karbala, Najaf, and Kufa, you, it, it's not a Shia issue. You really can't say it as a Shia issue. Uh, I think it's a complete Muslim Ummah issue. You know, it's not Bucky that they're destroying. They're destroying the entirety of Makkah and Medina and a lot of the masjids. Like this massive desecration of sites, and they're, you know, we think that they're anti-Shia, and they are. They might be, but they're just not. You know. It's like it's like basically the Khawarij taking over, you know, the Haraman. You know, uh, they are completely indiscriminate in how they treat the area. You know, so I do think it's a broader Muslim issue that needs a lot of awareness and education. And a lot of times when I have spoken about it in the past with my colleagues or uh, you know work people, I you know yeah, Bucky is an issue, but just the entirety of Makkah and Medina, you know, it's, it, it needs a lot of reform and a lot of oversight and uh, international intervention. Yes, um, mashallah. Um, those are very, very good points. Um, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Thank you all. Um